So that was actually uh, a wonderful talk when it was a perfect uh, segue into our next speaker. Um, and you'll see why in a second. Uh, Nancy Reichman is a professor of pediatrics at Robert Wood Johnson Medical School, one of the operating units of UMDNJ, and also of economics at Princeton University. She's a health economist that received her PhD at City University of New York. And Nancy's research focuses on socioeconomic determinants and consequences of child health. Her recent studies, many of which are based on New Jersey health data involved with the Fragile Family Study, are on the effectiveness of prenatal care, effects of neighborhoods on infant health, racial and ethnic disparities in infant health care, effects of children's health on families, and effects of welfare, Medicaid, and other policies on the well-being of children uh, and their families. So we took uh, you seriously, and we are, in fact, collaborating with an economist. And in fact, she's going to talk to us, I guess, about infant mortality a little bit. Right. So we're, we're on target. I want to add a personal note. Uh, uh, Nancy was one of the, the first and best appointments I made to Robert Wood Johnson as, uh, as uh, chairman. I was very proud to be a little bit outside the box and actually bring a health economist to the medical school. Uh, she's recently been promoted professor. She's received tenure. And so it's with a sense of uh, great pride. You did get tenure, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's with a sense of great pride that I'm able to introduce my friend Nancy Reichman. Nancy. Second, we just have to find the talk and get it loaded up. This is the one. Um, Reichman Pryor. Uh, yeah. Do you want the extra slides? No. Okay. Oops. There it is. Okay, and now I can throw something. Just the down? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Hi, everybody, um, and thank you very much for coming today. And hi to all my colleagues from Robert Wood Johnson Medical School, Department of Pediatrics. It's nice to see so many of you here. Um, today I'm going to be talking about birth outcomes in children's health care in New Jersey. I'm just going to put you on slide here. Yeah. Oh, it's not correct. Okay. There you go. Oh, thanks. Um, okay. Let me just get used to this. Why is this not? Oh, okay. Okay, so we've all seen this slide, and that's the reason why we're here today. Okay, New Jersey ranks in the bottom quartile in the country on health care for children. Okay, I am going to actually read with you a section of text that I'm going to dissect a little bit today, or a lot. Okay, so specifically on page three of the report, it says that the 13 states at the bottom quartile of the overall performance ranking, um, and New Jersey is in that list, as we all know, lag well behind their peers on multiple indicators. Uninsured rates for children in these states are well above the national averages and more than double those in the quartile of states with the lowest rates. In these states, Rates for receipt of recommended preventive care are generally low, while infant mortality and risk of developmental delay are often high. So I'm going to dissect this. I'm going to look at it under a microscope today with a focus on birth outcomes and health of very young children. Um, I just wanted to point out that I'm looking at all of this from a very high altitude, so to speak, and that I spend a lot of my time sitting at my computer, looking at numbers, reading, sitting at my desk at 3 in the morning when I should be sleeping, and trying to figure out how the, big, the pieces of the big picture fit together. I am not in the trenches like many of you are as a health care provider um, or a social worker, so I don't have those unique and important perspectives. But I think maybe I bring something to the table. Okay, so my objectives in my talk today are to describe patterns and trends in birth outcomes in New Jersey and the U.S., 
assess the extent to which the performance of the health care system for children in New Jersey reflects differences in um, birth outcomes between New Jersey and the U.S. And then I'm going to suggest potential strategies for improving health care and health of infants and children in New Jersey. And this is where I'm going out of the box a little bit. And I'm also taking the liberty to transcend a bit beyond the title of my talk. It's hard to lop it off. Okay. All right. Um, I will be talking a fair amount about low birth weight, which is the second leading cause of infant mortality in the U.S. after birth defects. It's associated with numerous morbidities among survivors, and I put a list there of some of the key ones, as well as cognitive deficits and school and behavior problems. The cost of low birth weight in the United States in 1988, which was 20 years ago, was estimated at 5.5 to $6 billion for that year. And as far as I know, there have been no comprehensive national estimates of the cost of low birth weight in the past two decades. It's not an easy thing to do. Okay. All right, I'm going to bore you with some definitions, and I apologize if it's too basic for many of you. Um, infant birth weight is an incredibly well-measured variable. I love it in my analyses. It's really clean. Um, it's well measured, it's reliably recorded, it's readily available from vital statistics and other databases. It's also used in international comparisons. Um, the standard definition of low birth weight is less than 2,500 grams or about 5.5 pounds. We can also talk about very low birth weight, which is um, less than generally less than 1,500 grams or three and a half pounds and virtually all um, all low birth weights babies are either preterm or small for gestational age and I have the definitions up there they can be both and virtually all very low birth weight babies are preterm okay so let's take a look at low birth weight in New Jersey because not only are there variations in health um, or health um, outcomes across states in the U.S., but there's also variations across the 21 counties in New Jersey. And I hope you, yeah, that's not too bad. Okay, the overall rate of low birth weight in New Jersey was 8% in 2004, with substantial variation across the 21 counties. The highest rates are, are where our largest cities, Newark, Trenton, and Camden are, and a few rural uh, counties in the south. If, if you looked at the same uh, map for very low birth weight, it's very similar, but it's not exactly the same. But it, it's the same basic uh, picture. Um, the patterns largely mirror poverty rates, even though, on the books at least, New Jersey has fairly generous Medicaid eligibility for pregnant women, um, and relatively perhaps, but in absolute terms, I'm not saying that, <laughs> that we're generous. Um, I'm just talking about compared to other states. So women in all counties should have access to good access to, pre in theory, good access to prenatal care, a topic I'll come back to later briefly. Um, we'll see in a minute how that 8% figure compares to the U.S. as a whole. And um, I am presenting data for 2004 for two reasons. One, to be as consistent as possible with the Commonwealth Report in which most statistics are from anywhere between 2002 and 2005, depending on the measure, and also for consistency with the other figures I'm going to be showing for which 2004 is the latest available data. Okay. So let's look at trends in low birth weight over time, both in New Jersey and in the U.S., and I'll walk you through these pictures. Here we're looking at the percentages of live births that are low birth weight, which is the top curves, the top two curves, and very low birth weight, which is the bottom two curves. And um, for consistency with all the graphs I'm going to be showing you, it's not too many, don't worry. I will be showing, um, New Jersey is always blue and the U.S. is always pink. Um, what we see here is that New Jersey is and has been exactly on par with the U.S. Um, in terms of low birth weight and very low birth weight um, in this 10-year period. Um, the slight upward trend in low birth weight reflects an increasing prevalence of multiple births. If I had shown you a graph of singleton births, 
the, the curves would all be completely flat. Okay. So we're like the U.S. on this indicator. Okay. Infant mortality is indicated earlier, low birth weight, particularly very low birth weight, is a strong risk factor for infant mortality, which is defined as death in the first year of life. And it's measured as deaths per 1,000 live births. What we see here is that New Jersey, which again is blue, um, had lower infant mortality rates than the U.S. through this entire 10-year period, and that the decline in New Jersey has been steeper than in the U.S. as a whole. Um, specifically, between 1994 and 2004, the infant mortality rate in New Jersey decreased by 27 percent from 7.8 to 5.7 deaths per 1,000 live births, compared to a decrease of 15 percent in the U.S. as a whole. Um, so, in fact, as indicated in the Commonwealth Report, New Jersey ranks 10th best in the nation in terms of its infant mortality rate. Um, therefore, in this particular indicator, the healthcare system in New Jersey is not failing its children. But this is only one indicator. Okay, so the rates of low birth weight and very low birth weight are the same in New Jersey and the U.S., and the infant mortality rates are lower in New Jersey than in the U.S., which is a good thing. Um, but remember, low birth weight, particularly very low birth weight, is associated with num numerous morbidities among those who survive. So here we're looking at one-year survival rates of low birth weight and very low birth weight infants born in the U.S. and New Jersey. Again, the top two curves are for low birth weight, and the bottom two curves are for very low birth weight, and they show the percentages of infants in the relevant groups who survived the first year of life and therefore are at elevated risk for health and developmental problems. Um, what we see is that for very low birth weight infants, survival rates are and have been over this 10-year period better in New Jersey than in the U.S. as a whole. Um, moreover, the rate of survival of very low birth weight infants seems to be increasing slightly in New Jersey while it has stayed flatter in the U.S. Um, overall. And these might not look like very big differences, and they don't involve a lot of people, but there's a pretty consistent trend here that New Jersey is doing better than the U.S. And those few kids use a lot of resources. Most kids aren't sick, and those kids consume a lot of health care resources. So I think this is important. Okay, so the good news is that the healthcare system in New Jersey is doing a really good job of saving babies compared to the U.S. overall. Um, and again, we have to keep that in perspective before we congratulate ourselves too much because our international ranking among developed countries is pretty poor. So we always have to keep that perspective in mind, as Ed said. Okay. So really, the New Jersey challenge. Um, let's go back to the report. New Jersey ranks poorly in child health system performance, and it's not because of infant mortality, which is one of the components. So what are the reasons? As I see it, there's three, one of which is not obvious from the report, another which stands out clearly in the report, and the third which is not um, straightforward. The first, the healthcare system in New Jersey is confronted with an increasing disproportionate rate of very low birth weight survivors. So we're saving these, these babies better than in the U.S. as a whole. This does not, as I said, it doesn't involve a large number of children, but these cases require high levels of resources and coordination. Um, okay, so, and success in this realm may make certain other indicators in the report look worse. For example, personal health care costs. Um, or a percent of children ages one to five years at moderate high risk of developmental delay. I don't think this could explain all of the disparity between New Jersey and the rest of the U.S. on that measure because it's not a lot of kids, but um, it could in an indirect way if it's related to a general aggressiveness of medical care that both saves babies and results in early diagnoses. It could make us look worse on that indicator. Um, the findings vis-a-vis -vis infant mortality and infant survival highlight how different indicators in the report are likely connected to each other. 
a positive on one dimension that is measured in the report, infant mortality, um, along with a positive dimension, uh, a positive on another dimension that was not measured, low birth weight survival, may cause some of the other negative, may cause some of the negatives, costs and risk for developmental delay, for example. A key reason for the low ranking in New Jersey is the high rate of uninsured children in the state. As we've seen, 11.9% um, of children aged 0 to 17 in New Jersey have no health insurance. And this gives New Jersey a rank of 37 in the country. The national average is, almost 10, is about 10%. And for poor children, as we saw before, New Jersey's ranking is even worse than that. The third potential reason that New Jersey ranks poorly is because of suboptimal use of health care, such as preventive care. Um, but New Jersey has mixed rankings in this regard, and I'll come back to this in a little bit. Um, Underutilization of care is likely, at least in part, to be related to insurance status. Okay. So potential strategies, and I'm not recommending these yet because we have to talk about them. Reduce low birth weight, increase children's health insurance coverage, and increase use of care. Reducing low birth weight is really difficult because the causes of preterm birth, which is about 70% of low birth weight um, infants, are not well understood. Um, low birth weight is strongly associated with poverty, and augmented prenatal care programs have been found to have favorable but small effects on low birth weight. Um, one of those is my study and another one by my colleague Ted Joyce um, on uh, New York's prenatal care assistance program. Um, coordinated and multifaceted care are the key features of the successful programs that seem to give them their success, although modest. And um, the current thinking um, is that prenatal care may be too little too late. Not that we shouldn't have prenatal care. Prenatal care is really, really important, and it shouldn't be taken away. It should be added to. But it may be too little too late to undo a lifetime of disadvantages health and socioeconomic disadvantages. So don't misinterpret me on that one. Don't take away prenatal care because it doesn't look like it works. Okay. Um, okay, increase insurance coverage. Um, it looked to me when I was looking through the different state policies, but again, I'm not an expert on this, that New Jersey is fairly generous compared to other states in terms of Medicaid S-CHIP el S -chip eligibility for children. I looked at the income eligibility limit, uh, limits the asset disregards legal immigrant eligibility. And therefore, and I could be wrong on this, oops. And therefore, increasing eligibility alone is unlikely to substantially improve New Jersey's ranking in terms of uninsured children. Okay. Now, in the fragile family study of mostly non-marital births in the urban US, which you're gonna be hearing about much more from the next speaker, um, 99% of the births were covered by health insurance. But one year later, 13% of the children had no health insurance. We found um, that both parents being immigrants increased the likelihood that the children, all of whom were born in the US and were therefore US citizens, lost coverage. Most studies that look at um, nativity status and health insurance, especially for newborns or children, young children, focus solely on the immigrant status of the mother. We found the strongest negative effects when both parents were immigrants, um, which probably increases the likelihood that the parents have no health insurance themselves or could reflect disconnection from the health care and social services systems or possibly fear of connection to those systems because of legal status or illegal status. Um, New Jersey is the fourth highest in the nation in terms of births to immigrant mothers. 32% um, of births in New Jersey in 2002 were to immigrant mothers. Um, in the United States, that figure is 22.7%. Uh, we also found that prenatal diagnosed maternal mental illness of any type increase the likelihood that children would have no health insurance at age one. This is consistent with findings from past research, including a study that found that uh, women with mental health problems are more likely to perceive barriers in enrolling in Medicaid. 
It's also consistent with historically poor coverage of mental health care by private insurance, which could reduce the incentive for those with mental illness to remain insured. Okay. So, how to increase coverage? Well, birth hospitals and social, since the kids, since the births are covered by insurance, um, all births pretty much are covered by insurance, birth hospitals and then subsequent social service encounters can be important checkpoints for encouraging and helping families maintain health insurance for their children. Oh, and a point that I forgot to bring up from the last slide, or from one of the previous slides, is that the parents' health insurance, parents having health insurance makes it more likely that their children have health insurance. So perhaps think about expanding parents' eligibility for public health insurance. 30% of the mothers in the Fragile Family Study were uninsured, of the mothers one year after giving birth, and 58% of the low-income fathers in the sample were uninsured one year after the birth. And the U.S. has a, virtually no health insurance safety net for men for poor men. Okay. Strategy number, potential strategy number three, increase the use of health care. New Jersey ranks poorly on some Commonwealth quality of care indicators. So I put the quality of care indicators up there and I put New Jersey's rankings and, and the, the rates. Um, so for example, uh, New Jersey ranks 38 on the percentage of children receiving um, all recommended vaccinations, and that um, would 78% of the children in New Jersey receive all of their recommended vaccines. Um, so the individual components, and so I've enumerated the individual components in New Jersey's rankings here with blue font for those in which New Jersey has a poor ranking. So it's not across the board here. It's specific items, specific indicators. So we can pretty much eliminate preventive care in terms of relative ranking. I'm not saying we're doing well enough, but in terms of relative ranking, we can pretty much eliminate preventive care, having a medical home, receiving referrals when needed, and use of hospital for asthma. We can eliminate them as sources, major sources of New Jersey's overall poor ranking. Um, where New Jersey does rank particularly poorly are for receiving recommended vaccines, um, receiving needed mental health care, and receiving follow-up care after specialty services. These, particularly the first two, may reflect lack of insurance, so the problem may stem back to the high rate of uninsured children. Um, so, um, or lack of insurance coverage, um, excuse me, lack of insurance or lack of insurance coverage for vaccines or mental health care, because those are issues. So overall, New Jersey's rankings on quality of care indicators are mixed and may be related to insurance, um, which is one of the other indicators. Again, we're seeing probable connections between these different indicators. Okay, this was brought up by Ed. Um, this is from 2003. Apparently it's changed. It's a Medicaid fee-for-service reimbursement for all 50 states. I pulled this from Kaiser State Health Facts. In 2003, Medicaid, um, New Jersey ranked the lowest out of all 50 states for Medicaid fee-for-service um, reimbursement. Difficulties finding Medicaid providers are uh, bound. I know that apparently two-thirds of um, Medicaid is Medicaid HMO in this, or, or maybe even 80 percent is uh, HMO, but still 20 percent uh, I think that's a figure Ed cited uh, in New Jersey is Medicaid fee for service. And difficult finding Medicaid providers abound. I have a highly educated friend and colleague whose daughter has Down syndrome and is covered by Medicaid in New Jersey. And my friend is a really resourceful person. And she has had major difficulty finding providers for her daughter who were willing to accept Medicaid for payment. Um, Many of you in the audience know more about this specific issue than I do, but I thought it was important to point out because not being able to provide, uh, to find a provider can reduce parents' incentive to maintain their children's health insurance. Okay. Another systematic problem which my colleague and I found indirect evidence of for in New Jersey involves language, cultural, communication issues. Um, we found that among mothers receiving enhanced prenatal care in New Jersey, the quality of birth certificate data on their medical risk factors during pregnancy was 
really particularly poor for mothers who were not proficient in English. Um, this suggests that health information may get lost in the system for parents who are not proficient in English and that better communication, perhaps through appropriate and culturally sensitive educational materials, could increase care among those with language barriers. And I sense that there's increasing research and policy interest in the effects of language barriers on health care. So I thought I'd put this out there, particularly since New Jersey is a high in, uh, immigration state. Okay. So it's vitally important to know which children in New Jersey are not getting routine care and why. Is it insurance? Is it personal barriers such as those I've went over or others? Are there systemic causes such as the low Medicaid fee-for-service reimbursement? And address those causes. Okay. So for a recap, the health care system in New Jersey is doing a great job of saving babies compared to the U.S. overall. Not compared to the world overall necessarily, but compared to the U.S. overall. The health care system in New Jersey is confronted with an increasing and disproportionate number of low birth weight survivors, which is the cost of success. Um, and that may make certain of the indicators in the report look worse, as I discussed earlier. There's evidence of personal and systemic barriers to young children's health insurance coverage and health care. Um, we found evidence in the U.S. as a whole that parents' mental health, insurance, and immigration status are strong determinants of insurance coverage. Um, and the low Medicaid reimbursement rate in New Jersey is another example of a potential barrier. Okay, so let's go back to the section of the Commonwealth Report that we read together at the beginning. And now, now that we kind of know a little more about what's going on in New Jersey, let's reevaluate this. Well, the 13 states at the bottom quartile of the performance ranking, of which New Jersey is one, lie well behind their peers on multiple indicators. I agree that uninsured rates for children in these states are well above national averages, and this is a huge problem. Um, in these states, rates um, for receipt of recommended preventive care are generally low, mixed. So I put it in gray, I think. Um, while infant mortality and risk of developmental delay are often quite high. And I crossed that one out because I, you know, you saw the infant mortality rate is very low in New Jersey. We're, we're saving babies. The risk for developmental delay might be related to that. So that one I'm, I wouldn't get too worked up about without more information. Um, so my summary of recommendations are surprisingly <laughs> simplistic. Um, identify reasons that children in New Jersey are uninsured and address those barriers. Reasons. <laughs> okay. Identify reasons that insured children and uninsured children actually are not getting care and address those barriers. So I think it's time for a comprehensive needs assessment, a population-based survey in the state and actually use the information, that, you know, well-designed comprehensive needs survey, and actually use that information and follow up with some kind of action. So that's my big recommendation for today. Thank you very much. Just working. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, but we have people who will come in, deliver from either out of state or out of the country, and then leave and leave us with the bill, which of course you can't get back. So have your numbers teased out, people that fly into America, deliver, and leave. That's one thing. No. So, okay. And I wasn't even aware that that's a big problem until this minute. So. Thank you. And I don't know how big a problem it is, but it's a big problem in, in your hospital. At yeah, Claire Moss. Uh, you may want to check that out. The second thing is, have you teased out the uh, uh, kids' care from the Medicaid? Because a lot of my patients, um, uh, I can't get them onto kids' care because they keep going on and off with the working. 
And the reason why I say that is not only being uninsured, but have you looked at whether the employers will give them time to get off work? Because the ones that I have on kids care are so scared of losing their job that not only can't they, or, or the ones that were thrown off kids care, for example, they're so afraid of getting, uh, they, they can't get out of work. Um, so uh, they either can't get on kids care or they can't get out of work to take their kids. And the third thing is, have you looked at the length of waiting times that even specialists that take kids, if it takes six or eight months to see an orthopedist or to see these specialists at centers, I just uh, lost a child with cystic fibrosis um, uh, who was one, one, week, uh, one block away from St. Joe's, but uh, the kid had to walk there because the parent was never around to take him, so he finally died. But, I mean, have you looked at those kind of numbers? I haven't studied those things in my research, but I sense that they're potentially very important, and that's why I'm advocating for a comprehensive needs survey in New Jersey to really get the data on those things, and maybe some focus groups at the beginning to identify the issues that should be asked about. hard standing up. Um, and Dan, I am going to work Abraham Lincoln into this, so I want you to pay attention, okay? It wasn't easy either, too, okay? Um, i just struck by the theme through all three presentations about um, access to care is the problem and insurance is the bigger problem. And just to be heretical about that, uh, I think we're missing the forest for the trees. Uh, we spend plenty of money on health care in this state and in this country, um, twice as much per capita as our industrial peers, essentially. It's what happens to those dollars that's killing us, strangling us. Here in New Jersey, our insurance intermediaries are responsible for more than 50 cents on the dollar um, just being retained by their profits and their administrative activities. So 50 cents on the dollar goes to direct patient care, and that's it. The Canadian model... Uh, 95 cents on the dollar goes to patient care. If you look at what happens with behavioral health care, 70 cents on the dollar is retained by the insurance intermediaries. Here it comes, Dan, all right? One score, and I think about five years ago, we in this nation went bonkers with health insurance, okay? We entered into this managed care era about 25 years ago, and somehow we all acquiesced to that. I'm as guilty as a physician and a provider and a health policy person as anybody else, but. Everybody acquiesced to this model of having this insurance intermediary that takes so much money out of the system, provides nothing. They don't really provide insurance anymore. They're not really even insurance companies. They are a prepaid, a semi-prepaid healthcare intermediary. And that's it. We don't need them. Um, mm -hmm. And I mean, I think that you know, we have to... Where were all you people at my last run for office, okay? Anyway, um, we, we just have to look at a new model. And the more we keep trying to take this square peg and push it into a round hole, the, we're never going to get anywhere. Because uh, there's no more money to be had. We have to be realistic about that. But we have to confront the kind of corporate overstructure that we have for this. And mm -hmm. I'll say goodbye with that. Thank you. So, uh, Nancy, uh, I think you two need to be on Barack's cabinet. So, <laughs> I'm more for you. Um, you mentioned something that I, th that I think is particularly exciting for New Jersey, uh, and that is the um, the role that uh, peripartum depression or mental health issues in general plays in a person's ability to seek care, to service their children's needs, and so forth. Uh, thanks to uh, Governor Cody, we have in New Jersey a very enviable system. I know it's enviable because whenever we go to national conferences, people come over and proceed to envy us. Uh, and that is the, uh, the postpartum depression um, 
uh, processes. Uh, arguably about 11 to 16,000 of our 120,000 births a year would qualify uh, based on the, the um, incidence of postpartum depression. In New Jersey, we have every woman who gives birth evaluated. And if needed, that person is triaged through to care. So you have a system of people taking a look at the highest risk individuals. And plenty of studies, as you know, exist that say these are the people who smoke the most, get the kids into health care the least, on and on. Well, perhaps something in terms of policy could consider having an, an additional vigilance applied so that uh, enrollment issues around the, at, uh, uh, children could be considered for the group identified with having these uh, problems. Mm -hmm. Extra vigilance, extra support, uh, so it's not only mental health services for the mothers that are the outcome point, but also making sure that the kids are enrolled and that the access and support for getting them to services is maintained. We already have the infrastructure, right. and that's, so we may be important. able to model yeah, it further. <laughs> We're going to take a quick break, but if you could be back as soon as possible, because our next speaker is on a tight schedule and needs to move out. So if you could uh, be back about quarter of, that would be appreciated. <coughs> <laughs> 